Good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and what an honor it is to have as our guest, Professor Robert Higgs. Bob Higgs is uh, an extraordinary man, an extraordinary libertarian, and as, as I can testify from having heard him, an extraordinary teacher as well. He's taught at a number of universities. Uh, he's been uh, senior fellow in political economy at the Independent Institute. He's senior fellow at the Mises Institute. Uh, he won the Gary Schlarbaum Prize for a lifetime achievement in the cause of liberty and the tradition of Mises uh, from the Mises Institute. Uh, many other prizes. He's the author of uh, I thought 12 books, now I learned 13, a new one coming out shortly called Taking a Stand. Bob, we could talk about so many things that you're expert in, um, but one, uh, one, of your, one of your lectures that uh, stayed with me, maybe more than almost any of the others, which is saying something, uh, was one I'd sum up by saying, uh, is the U.S. government going to blow up the world? <laughs> Do you want to talk to us about that? <laughs> well, uh Lou, as you know, uh, people argue all the time about the uh, the positives and the negatives of the state. And uh, those of us who are individualist anarchists uh, uh, talk a lot about what we believe would be the virtues and benefits of a stateless society. But uh, much of that discussion has to be conjectural because... Uh, Stateless societies are relatively rare, not non-existent, but uh, there have not been very many of them in history. And so uh, there's a, there's a uh, almost a vacuum of hard facts that we could advance to uh, support our cause. And we, we have to rely more on analysis, on, uh, on the logic of situations and so forth. And up against... Uh, our arguments are generally people who believe that the state is, if not a positive good, uh, it's uh, unavoidable, and in any event, it's uh, it's essential because it provides certain certain goods and services that, uh, at least its defenders claim, would not be provided at all or provided sufficiently uh, without the states making that provision. So um, this debate in which you and I have uh, have both uh, been involved for a, a very long time is uh, is almost tiresome sometimes because we run through the same uh, claims and counterclaims again and again and again. And every time some, some new person enters the discussion, and we have to almost retrace uh, 50 years of old ground, uh, if not more. But uh, one of the things that struck me in thinking about this question uh, for many years is that that, that people uh, fail to think at all or fail to think very hard about what a dangerous institution the state is. And uh, even though states in history have done uh, horrible things, uh, and uh, I think that's a, a huge mark against them if that's all we had against them. Uh, nevertheless, if we combine state power with the technology that's available to states today, uh, not only uh, military technology, but uh, the technology of, of mass surveillance, uh, the technology of uh, attempted mind control, and and other uh, nefarious technologies. We 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 get an institution which uh, really has awesome power for evil. And uh, what I've tried to do uh, as my little contribution to this discussion. It is to bring to the forefront uh, those awesome powers and to show with actual historical evidence that uh, one is not simply conjecturing about what states will do when they have that kind of power. We don't have to go very far back uh, in, you know, in the lifetime even of many people who are alive today to find states engaged uh, in the most horrifying destructive actions. And, and yet, yet people tend to put those aside and say, but what about the roads and what about the garbage collection and so forth? <laughs> it seems to me that all those things really pale beside the risk 
that uh, people run when states are in charge of society. And so I've tried tried to uh, pursue my thinking along those lines. And uh, and you, as you know, I've I've lectured uh, along those lines at the Mises University uh, in the past. And and I may I may do it again if I have a chance because I think this is, I think this is really a terribly important matter that people need to think about more seriously. And of course, with the U.S. Empire, uh, we have a a state that is more powerful than any state that's ever existed, that seems to have the, the ambition to be the world state, uh, that sees nothing beyond it, whether it's uh, international soccer or whatever, that sees, sees nothing beyond its control, uh, would like to take over the solar system in outer space, <laughs> so far as I can tell as well. Um, there's a, seems uh, to have a, you know. There's a term that uh, they use at the Pentagon called full spectrum dominance. And that means that uh, the military people are researching and developing technologies with an eye toward controlling the air, the land, the sea, and space, which doesn't leave any place for us to run, really. So <laughs> uh, I think you're, you're right that uh, the ambitions of the power wielders uh, have no limits, uh, and they have uh, neither technological nor moral limits. I think that uh, moral part is even more critical than the technological part. Sometimes we can think of obstructions or workarounds uh, in the technology. We can think of ways that we might prevent harm to ourselves. But but when states are in the hands of essentially immoral people, as I believe practically every one of them is, and certainly the U.S. state, uh, then we've got a serious problem because we're up against people who will not restrain themselves from doing evil. And uh, so we, ha we have to somehow work against that and try to open the eyes of enough people that they will, they will stop complying with the uh, dictates and desires of these evil people. Bob, I've often thought it's important to try to communicate to people in this, in this exactly what you're talking about, that uh, the leaders in the state uh, may decide to do something or not to do something on the basis of whether it's they believe it's prudent for themselves or whether it's actually practical to carry it out. It's never a consideration, well, we can't do that because it's wrong. <laughs> never. Never, 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 never. I, I think you'd, you'd have trouble finding uh, in the past hundred years uh, – uh, a half dozen examples of state uh, authorities who restrained themselves from doing evil because they explicitly s said, as it were, we can't do that. That would be wrong. Uh, they, they, they do all kinds of things and, and refrain from things uh, on grounds of expedience, as you say. But those are, are self-interested calculations. They're, they're not uh, guided by or, or ruled by any kind of higher moral thinking. And yet people don't sometimes don't seem to be worried. It's just recently come out that the Pentagon mailed uh, anthrax to uh, a bunch of laboratories around the country and, and around the world by mistake. Uh, <laughs> So was anybody killed by this? This is, of course, one of the WMDs that uh, they, they specialize in. But I can't seem to tell that the American people even care. I mean, doesn't – whereas if it turned out that, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda did this, why it would be the end of the world and we'd yeah. have to nuke the entire Middle East? Well, as you know uh, very well, Lou, back in the 50s and 60s, the, uh, the Pentagon uh, carried out a variety of experiments uh, on the unwitting American people. It sprinkled pathogens of various kinds over entire cities to find out what would happen and to, to test hypotheses about various uh, antidotes and what have you. And, and so, you know, pe people are simply ignorant, Lou, but I think the ordinary person has no idea whatsoever of, of the depths of evil that the state uh, has evinced uh, in its history. This is not speculation on anybody's part. These, these actions are actually well documented at this point, although one presumes that there are all sorts of things that, that haven't been brought to light yet, 
just as Edward Snowden not long ago brought to light the massive uh, spying uh, of the NSA on everybody, uh, so far as I can tell, not just everybody in the United States, but but if possible, everybody on Earth, uh, so far as electronic uh, communication is concerned. So, so, so people just don't know, uh, and they 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 believe the kind of foggy uh, uh, portrait that's painted for them by state authorities and the mass media. And, uh, and and when you tell them something, but look, think about this thing the state did. Uh, their first inclination is to deny it or to say, you know, that's just a conspiracy theory or there's no good evidence for it or that was an exception to the rule. Uh, so there, there's such a built-in uh, intransigence that has been... Uh, Put there by state efforts in in, in education and and the media and and in the public pronouncements of uh, public officials o- over the years that uh, most people have been taken in by it. Bob, I've often thought that the uh, the riveting part of the New Testament where the devil takes the Lord up to the top of the mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and <laughs> says, all these can be yours if only you'll bow down. It's always meant to me that the devil has this within his gift, that there is actually something uh, diabolical about political power. Uh, I, I believe that's so, Lou. I mean, uh, it, you know, just uh, from a historical standpoint, uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to deny, even if you're, you're not much of an ethicist, that states have done one evil thing after another. And, you know, uh, sometimes when you tell people that, they say, yeah, but that's just people, you know, private people do evil things too. <laughs> well, of course they do, but uh, but they don't do them on the scale, and they don't do them with similar impunity. And that's, uh, that's the problem that people need to worry about a lot more than they do. Bob, uh, you've been a great scholar. You are a great scholar. Uh, we're going to list, of course, some of your books. Um, but your your life is about to take a turn. You and uh, your wife, Elizabeth, are going to be moving to Mexico where you're building a house. And I hear tell that you're going to start a school for 100 Mexican children. <laughs> well, we are moving, Lou, uh, I think within the next few months, uh, God willing. <laughs> and uh, And the guys building our house stay on the job. But uh, I, I'm not going to start a school. What we are going to do is, uh, I'm sure we'll we'll involve ourselves as uh, Elizabeth has already started to do, in helping the children in the village uh, near where we'll be living. It's a little place of about 400 people called Ishkalak, and there's a school there that runs through elementary school, which is uh, six grades in Mexico. And uh, even though a couple of school teachers are sent out to to teach, uh, they don't always show up. And even when they do, the children uh, have no school materials to work with. They, all those things have to be provided by their parents. And so uh, we can help out. Uh, we've already, you know, sent some stuff to the school uh, for the kids to use, books and school supplies and what have you, and uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if if Elizabeth and, and probably uh, me as well uh, were to get uh, much more involved in helping out there. Do you think that, um, just thinking about the future, that uh, uh, the radioactivity activity won't reach that part of Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't investigated that. We have put a lot of thought into finding out whether we are sufficiently remote uh, and in a place that uh, is uh, not endowed with anything that attracts either the Mexican government uh, uh, in any substantial way or the drug lords. So uh, uh, it's a it's a very far away into the road type uh, location. Uh, I might add, however, that it is a tropical paradise, so I, I don't want to make it sound like all hardship. It's uh, it's not that at all. But uh, but it's not like being in a place where wealth attracts predators uh, of various kinds. And uh, 
So we're, in that respect, uh, we're looking forward to living in a place where order is really in the hands of the local people. And uh, I think it's instructive that in our inquiries, we, uh, we basically found that there's, there is no serious crime there. Uh, you know, small burglaries seem to be the worst thing that uh, ever happens. Uh, no violent crime and and people take care of one another and uh, look out for one another. And, of course, they don't put up with uh, people who commit serious crimes. So uh, justice is more swift and more effective. And uh, and that, that's as it ought to be. It ought to be that way everywhere. Fred Reed, the wonderful writer who, who uh, also lives in Mexico, uh, argues that despite what you might what one might think about the situation, about the nature of the Mexican government or whatever, uh, that it's far fr it's a far freer country than the United States that you if you if you're not involved in politics you're pretty much left alone I think that's uh, for the most part true Lou I mean they the Mexican government does have a bureaucracy that tries to do all sorts of things as we discovered in getting the permits to build our house inside a, a national park <laughs> But uh, despite that, the day-to-day -day life uh, is much freer for Mexicans. They're not ordered about to the same extent that Americans are. They're not held to the endless regulations. They're not uh, spied on uh, every time they make a move. And uh, this isn't because the Mexican government is a, is a bunch of saints by any means, but uh, it's because the Mexican government... Uh, does not have the same resources that the U.S. and other advanced uh, countries, uh, governments have at their disposal. Uh, the Mexico, I'm sure, could, could not afford to build an elaborate NSA uh, as uh, the U.S. government can afford by virtue of its enormous predation on the productive people of this country. Other people have pointed out that uh, while the taxes may seem to be high, in fact, they're not high as compared to the United States because people don't pay them. <laughs> and uh, Fred said he didn't even mind uh, a certain level of bribery as versus taxation. He said, at least when I'm paying off the cop, I know it's going to support that guy's family. <laughs> so he said, rather than just going into the mob, Washington, D.C., and I have no, absolutely no idea what the heck is happening to it. <laughs> Well, that's true. You're 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 closer to the enforcement in Mexico, <laughs> but we we have to recognize that there's a lot of a uh, first stage predation taking place in in the United States now too. You know, a lot of people driving down here in my part of the country are just stopped by police and robbed, uh, especially if they're uh, if if they are Mexicans or other foreigners who have some reason to, you know, to, to maintain their privacy and to carry a lot of cash around. Uh, the, the police have no reluctance at all about simply stealing these people's money. And uh, I, I don't hear about that sort of thing in Mexico. And, and, and in fact, even the usual tales about having to pay off a cop who stops you for speeding or something, uh, turn out to be ones that you can bargain down pretty pretty far <laughs> and still not have to go beyond uh, paying a little mordida to the uh, to the policeman but uh, I've also talked to people who've lived there for a long long time and have had virtually no such encounters at all so so I I'm, I'm not uh, thinking it's going to be a part of daily life at all, and I am expecting things to be relatively peaceful uh, in the life I'm I'm planning to lead there. Well, Bob, it's magnificent, and we're going to miss you here. And I hope that you're. Uh, I know it's not your your first uh, your first goal, but it'd be wonderful if you could still be involved uh, via Wi-Fi uh, with those of us you've left behind in our in our dictatorial corrupt and uh, quite outrageous and frightening United States of America. But God bless you and Elizabeth for uh, doing this. I think it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I hope you'll at least tell us more about what happens to you and, and uh, uh, the wonderful life you're going to be leading. Well, thank you, Lou. I really appreciate your good wishes. And uh, we will miss a lot of people that we have frequent contact with in the United States. But as you know, there's no free lunch and there's no free tropical paradise either. 
So uh, I will have Internet, and I don't know exactly how I'll be living once I'm there. We have to be fairly self-sufficient. But uh, if it turns out to be uh, possible and uh, and my mind is bent in that direction, I'll just continue to make a nuisance of myself uh, on the World Wide Web. Well, that's magnificent, Bob. You're a star, a scholarly star, a, a teaching star, a writing star, and uh, now you're going to be a star of Mexico, too. So that's uh, pretty neat. <laughs> Estrella. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, thank you very, very much. Thanks for having me, Lou. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you.